So hello again, my name is Karen Pere de Santillan, and um, today I'll be talking to you about analyzing modern architectures. I'm, I'm just going to um, go over some tactics and strategies. So I hope that all of you are enjoying the Masiano workshop so far, and I hope that you will uh, maybe pick something up from this presentation that you can use during the workshop. So here's what I'll be discussing today. I'll be talking about why we analyze architecture, then I'll touch upon some of the most, um, well, the more common methods that um, that are used, that I have used. And then I will briefly show how, how I applied these in my own research. Then I'll give a short summary. So to start, why do we analyze architecture? Why do we need to look at what was already what has already been built. Basically, we do it to learn, to learn about ourselves, to learn about society. We learn from built form and um, we learn that it affects us. It affects um, how we live our life. And in turn, we also affect it. We can change it. You know? um, we study it in order to understand, for example, why does a church look like a church? Why do certain spaces have to be organized in a certain manner for them to be easily recognizable? And lastly, we analyze architecture in order to improve. Because as we know, architecture is not perfect. You know, we, we're designing for today, but um, we're also designing for tomorrow, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. So we don't know if our structure today will be able to adapt to the needs of tomorrow. For example, this pandemic, who, who would have thought that this would happen? So, of course, our architecture is not prepared for that. So what do we get um, when we analyze architecture? We can get a typology, for example. Um, for example, when you look at uh, similar forms and spaces, like, for example, health spaces, um, they are organized in a certain manner. So when you design them, you, know, you can refer to other examples and look how they are laid out in order to design them properly. Uh, we also can build um, an architectural vocabulary and we, can, we are able to define architectural character. And because of that, our design vocabulary, you know, um, how we perceive design, how we relate to design becomes much wider our viewpoint you know becomes much wider the more we learn about architecture the more we analyze why architecture works so when we study buildings we look at two sets of data first is the archival data and then we have our social cultural data um Sorry. So next is um, the other type of data is the physical data. So these are actual observations on form and space, on circulation and organization. So correlating these two sets of data allows us to understand architectural character. But what exactly is architectural character? So architectural character relates to visual and physical aspects that relate to our perception of built form. So this can be common to a particular time, for example, like how in the Middle Ages, everything was Romanesque before it turned Gothic, right? Or it can be um, associated with a particular place, like how, for example, Spanish colonial houses in Vigan are of a particular style and don't look like houses of the same period in Manila. So character can also be specific to a person. So for example, this could be the architect, uh, his body of work, or a specific patron that deals with uh, a particular area. Okay, So uh, this could be also connected to function. So as I said before, like how we look at the building and know that it is a church or a hospital or a house, you know, just by looking at it. Because there has to be something both uh, visual and physical that would affect our perception of the structure. 
So, but as we previously pointed out, it's not enough to look solely at the visual. This information has to be taken into context with the historical, social, cultural, economic, and political situation at the time that the architecture was produced. So architecture needs to be assessed holistically. So in this workshop, as, as we said, we are trying to define the character of modern architecture in the ASEAN region. So in particular, in the Philippines. But before we get to that, we have to remind ourselves of the character of modern architecture. What is modern architecture? So according to the International Committee for Documentation and Conservation of Building Sites and Neighborhoods of the Modern Movement, or DOCOMOMO, modern architecture has the following characteristics. Firstly, its design must be modern, meaning it looks toward the future, unencumbered by any historical precedent. Secondly, rather than emphasizing craftsmanship, like in, in the past, no? or ornamentation, um, what is emphasized in modern architecture is the function and the use and other um, perhaps technical and spatial properties. So lastly, um, modern architecture is conscious of what it is. It knows that it is modern and it is unapologetically so. So here are some styles that encapsulate um, architecture of the modern era. So we have Art Deco, Brutalist, Modernism, Deconstructivism, Late Modern, Metabolism, Organic, and Prairie School, among others. But now that we've defined what modern architecture is in, in the West, what about Asia? What about Southeast Asia? Is there a modern ASEAN architecture? How is it different from Western examples? This is exactly what the Masayana Project hopes to answer, and your output from this workshop is actually going to produce baseline data, which is the first step toward understanding, defining, and conserving modern architecture in the Philippines. So now let's look at some methods that are commonly used to study architecture. Um, how, do we, how do we evaluate architecture? No? So um, this is mentioned in the... Uh, what do you call this? The presentation of Architecnico, um, significance, and I think to a certain extent by Dr. Ho in our keynote no, during the opening, that there are certain values. No? You have to say what is important about a building. You can't just say, conserve this. It's important. Of course, people will ask why. Why is it important? And you have to list down the different values that make it important. So some of the values that um, are, are uh, being looked at are, for example, technological merit, social merit, aesthetic and artistic merit, canonic merit, referential value, and integrity. But how do we evaluate this? What kind of data should we look at? So I was looking at these um, values, you know, and I was trying to see if I were going to analyze this, what kind of data would I look at in a particular building? So, for example, in um, uh, in technological merit, it would be building materials and technology. So something like that. And I'll um, discuss this further in our uh, succeeding examples. So again, how do we evaluate technological merit? Um, as I said, we look at the building materials. We look at building technology. So does the building make use of modern technological innovations to solve the structural, the programmatic, or aesthetic challenges. No? So it has to be, it has to answer one of these questions if it has technological merit. One example that comes to mind um, when it comes to pioneering building technology is the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice at the University of the Philippines. So this was designed by Leandro Luxin and the structural structural engineer was um, uh, Alfredo Junio of the UP College of Engineering, and this was built by David Gonsunhi of BMCI. So the UP Chapel necessitated the use of thin shell concrete, and this was the first time that this was used in the country. And because it was the first time that it was used, they had to make use of new materials 
And you're saying like, wait, they use concrete before. What's new about that? Now, um, they at that time, no, they were already using 2,400 PSI concrete. But because of, of uh, the quality, you know, the thin shell of the dome, they needed to use a stronger concrete, so 3,000 PSI. And because of this, they couldn't use the normal technologies that they, that that were being used you know, in, in concrete, like the concrete chute, because um, the, the, the concrete would, if they used the chute, the concrete would be runny, and they wouldn't be able to achieve the shape of the dome that they wanted to build. You know? So they actually had to pour this whole thing manually, manually for 18 straight hours. You know? So it is really a feat of engineering how they were able to do this. No, without any sophisticated equipment, just you know, um, their their uh, their buggies, their their wheelbarrows, um, and concreting towers where the concrete was mixed, and then it would be loaded onto the buggy, and then they would go around and pour it until they they had um, done every area in the dome. So this was done manually. This is really a feat of engineering. So there's even a very good story about this. Like um, uh, when on the day of the concrete pouring, Father Delaney um, gave the go ahead to David Gonsun he to pour, but it looked like it was going to rain. But Father Delaney, who was in charge, um, who was who was um, chaplain at the time, he said, "No, go ahead. You take care of the building. We will take care of the praying." And it and in his memoirs, no, David Gonsun he was writing that. It was so curious that during that time, you no, know, it was raining all around the UP campus. He could see that the people were super wet, you no, know, dashing from one building to the other, but it never rained on the site. For 18 straight hours during the time they were pouring, it didn't rain at all. You no. Know? And when he, he looked in on Father Delaney, he saw that uh the good father had organized students who were praying in relays. They were literally storming the heavens with prayers so it only started to rain after after the final um touches were made by konsun he and his team no and it was time for curing and that was when the light rain started to fall so yeah things like that um i but i think there's a lot of of this building technology these innovations that we are not documenting that we don't deem significant enough but these are actually very important milestones milestones in our development no in our development as a nation no? as and and our architecture in our building forms so these are milestones that shape our building industry so the next example is um, the Coconut Palace by, uh, of course, Francisco Maniosa. And when we think about building materials, this is something that comes, comes to mind, though, because it was, um, it's a prime example of modern vernacular. It's a reinterpretation of the Bahay Kubo at a large scale. No? This building was uh, intended for the use of the Pope when he visited, but of course, the Pope never stayed here because he said it was too opulent for him. So um, as much as 70% of this structure is made out of uh, materials that came from the coconut tree. So this is coconut lumber, coconut husk, coconut shells, everything. No? And then the rest are made of Philippine hardwood and Philippine marble. So all the materials that went into this structure are from the Philippines. No? Um, when I think of how to evaluate a structure in terms of material, you know, I'm thinking we could devise ways um, to, to assess the conditions of the material. How, how did it weather? Is it still in good condition? Because we'll be able to test if coconut as a building material is actually something we should invest more in research and development, right? Because we have a lot of it. Next is social significance or social merit. Um, when you think of this, you're thinking about, is there a conscious decision on the part of the architect to use his architecture as a way to improve people's way of life you know, or to change the way that things were done in, in, in the area or, or um, in society at that time? 
um, one of the things that we learn early on in architecture is um, that built forms and spaces are not static because, yeah, the building, the the buildings and spaces don't move, but we do. And as we walk through all of these forms and spaces, the space changes and develops. No? Our viewpoint changes the space. And it tells a story. And that is, and how effective we understand that story is, is how effective the building is, the circulation of the building is. So we study circulation because it helps us understand wayfinding. It allows us to optimize plans for efficiency and safety. And um, it, it can help us predict spatial patterns. So the next few slides I'll be showing you are from uh, are actually done by the architect Paul Rudolph. So he was analyzing the circulation in Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona pavilion. You know? So here's the first sketch, and you can see that he's starting here and he's showing us this route no as he goes through the the pavilion and he says that even though um Mies laid this out in an open plan um the the character of the architecture is such that it it dictates certain pauses in the architecture that even though it's open um you can actually kind of predict how people will move through the space So here's another of his studies that I think he's looking at the quality of the views at different points from within the structure. And this one looks like a combination of the two previous ones. So you see an obvious path, but you also see stopping points within that path that take in um, for the person to take in certain views. So this kind, looking at that, it kind of reminds me of this small chapel in Novaliches, Quezon City. Although... Um, this has seats and a fixed altar that you can or orient yourself towards. The way that the three entrances were laid out is, is really very interesting. So this is how it looks like inside. You'll see that although the ceiling is very low, at the far end where the altar is, you know, it's very bright and the light comes from above, but also from the side, you know, where there is also a, an opening. So basically, this is the layout of the church. And please forgive my SketchUp skills in 2005. But you can see how the walls were arranged in such a way that the views to the altar are open. They're direct, but they're still controlled. No? Um, they actually uh, control how much the viewer sees at certain angles. You don't. He, he doesn't show them everything. And for me, this was very, this reminded me of the Barcelona Pavilion because it's like a series you're, you're, you're showing people small views at a time. Now, it's that kind of thinking when I look at this. And this is located in the middle of a memorial park. So it's actually targeting people from the sides, from the front to participate in the mass, you know, when there's something going on. But at the same time, they're not fully exposing the people within. So actually, this was very poetic, a very poetic arrangement for me you know, of the walls. It was very intriguing. So I also like the circulation techniques that Luxin used in some of his buildings at the CCP complex. Um, for example, in the PICC, when you enter the building, you're forced into a process of separation. You know, you're coming from the outside. It's, you know... It's wide, it's open, and then you're forced to a very, you know, um, low canopy. And then uh, there's a process of separation and reintegration by the alternation of the spatial character of the spaces. You know? So the separation of the dominant spaces is highlighted because there's a different architectural character for each. So when you, as I said, you enter the building through a low cantilevered canopy. So you see the canopy there. And it seems to propel the movement into the space because you don't want to stay under the canopy because, of course, parang it's pressing down on you. So you're, you're forced to move forwards. And when you do move forward, you, know, you are greeted by this wide expanse of the lobby. So it's it's a bit of a surprise, you no? Know, um, from the dark into the light. So this, this um movement is again repeated when you move from the lobby to the plenary hall. So it's connected by this narrow corridor that is actually 
you know, it's actually wide. I'm sorry, it's not narrow, but it's narrow vertically because it's very low. The ceiling is super low. Um, and it, the only saving grace that it's not, it doesn't feel claustrophobic is that it's open at both sides. You know? So it, 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 um, it actually propels people to move toward the plenary, plenary hall. No, so that they are not stuck in in this corridor. No, so it's it's actually very very well done. No? How how it was emphasized. So next is artistic and um, aesthetic merit. So is the building beautiful? No, as architects were taught to design beautifully. How do you judge beauty? Does it manifest? skillful um, composition? Does it exhibit very good proportion and scale? Or does it make use of materials very nicely? So some um, some techniques that I use, no? um, first is the Noli map. So I like to use this technique when I am assessing a lot of data. So of course, this um, method was pioneered by Giambattista Noli, who is best known for his plan of Rome. Um, and this is now known as the Noli map. So I like this because it, it allows you to simplify data, you know, and you are able to focus on what you want to see. Some examples, you know, uh, modern applications include, um, of course, this study uh, from Learning Las Vegas by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And over time, this technique has been reinterpreted in many ways. It's been used to study open space, shape and form, ration of opening to wall, and so on. So basically what we're doing here is we're separating the figure from the ground by only using two colors, no? black and white. You know, so it's, it's, it's easy for you to see what you want to focus on. And we've used this, for example, in the analysis of built form. Um, for example, this comparative analysis of the Church of Gimbal in Iloilo. In particular, we looked at how the belfry changed over time and how reasons, no, reasons of this corresponded to archival and historical data. No? So we were we were able to understand why the church had changed and why its belfry morphed from a more squat version that was similar to Miagao to the leaner and, and taller version that we see in the church nowadays. So the modern day version of the belfry is um is taller, much taller than the church, and it even incorporates neo-Gothic motifs, which is very different from the Baroque church, from the small Baroque church beside it. So the next example is canonic merit. Is the building the work of a notable architect? Does it represent a characteristic that is common to his work? Or a turning point even, does it show a complete break? So a visual survey um, I like to use this. It basically surveys a body of work based on a certain time. Um, it could be uh, divided by function, a specific time frame, or a specific person. So by doing this, we are able to check for changes in the style. So for example, I did a visual survey of Luxin's work. And in particular, his churches, he produced 11 churches and chapels. So I grouped the spaces into primary spaces, secondary spaces, and what I call in-between or liminal spaces. So I looked at how people use these spaces to separate the exterior and the interior of the church. So although a lot of the forms varied greatly, I observed similarities in how the spaces were organized and how these are kind of reinterpretations of the traditional Spanish colonial churches. Next is building information modeling or BIM. So this is really interesting because it's it's a great tool for collaborative work and allows you to study a building using simulations. So just to show you, it was um, a big part of Project Zone, wherein they sought to recreate the bank of uh, the Bank of England in London using BIM, and as we know, this is uh, this building is already lost. No, but with this project, it allowed people to visualize certain aspects of it, certain areas within it, so that they could continue to study the building even if it's gone. And they even have a virtual reality program wherein you can, you know, visit the site and go enter the building virtually. 
and it's a great way to experience a lost building. So this is not BIM, but this is my study of Luxine's Monterey Apartments in SketchUp. So the building was lauded for its transparency and lightness. Um, and I thought that this was very apparent in the lobby of the building, wherein you had a floating staircase over an ornamental pool of water. And even the canopy, you, know, you can see the, 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 the planes of the canopy sort of floating with the glass very transparent over there. Um, so next, we're looking at referential value. So did, did this building subsequently influence and fire the imagination of the next generation of architects? Um, this is useful. Comparative formal analysis. No? It's very useful if you want to, ana to analyze a building um, in the context of its environment. For example, if it's a church, what other churches are in the area? Um, are there formal or spatial connections or none? No? What does this mean? Um, in the conservation management plan for the Manila Central Post Office building, we utilized, among others, the comparative analysis method to establish significance. Um, since there were no previous um, post office buildings of the same scale as, uh, as the post office building, we looked at similar neoclassical buildings in the U.S. and in Europe to see whether there were formal and spatial similarities. So buildings examined include the Altus Museum, um, the New York Central Post Office Building, and the Federal Trade Commission Building. So we do this in order to answer the question, how unique is this building? Uh, how, what is the pedigree of this building? How unique is it in the whole scheme of things? Because that is when you can answer, is it really worth conserving? So we also studied archival documents in order to understand the site, how it changed over time. Um, so in this case, this was the oldest map you know, from the 1900s until 2019. So next is evaluation of integrity. So we look first at the timeline. So just like people. People, buildings age. They go through a lot and this affects their form. So it's very important to understand how exactly a building changed over time. So we like to do our archival research first and we do this in Excel file. We group them into um, specific periods with the dates, with the events, the changes, the people concerned, and of course the sources. So we arrange everything chronologically and afterwards we come up with this, which is a visual timeline. This was done by um, architect uh, Donna Orozco uh, and uh, the people at uh, MNL Solutions. So uh, at the bottom, you see the complete timeline for the for the building. And here you can see a close up. No, You have dates and you have what, what happened during those dates and how the use and the structure changed. So we also produced, um, what do you call this, um, visual timelines in order to correlate the historical notes with the physical elements. So this allows us actually to understand the different layerings of the buildings. No, not everything was built at once. Maybe some parts have been changed. Maybe some parts are not the same anymore. So this was done by architect Ron J. Mabunga. Next is the conditions assessment. So it is an examination of actual building conditions. So the, previously we were looking at historical data, but now we're looking at actual data, actual physical data. So here our team walks around the post office building and they take note of structural defects. So you see them on the roof, in the hallways. And what they do, they take photos and they note these observations directly onto the photos, which is a very great time-saving tool you'll see here. No? And you can see that we use color-coded symbols to indicate defects. So this is an example of a finished conditions assessment of Gimbal Church. This is the work of architect Cham Odan. No? And here is another one or so related to that. You can see how the walls with specific defects uh, are indicated and it makes it easier for the team to make an assessment of how, how much work needs to be done no? on the whole structure. So next is application. So this is the last, almost the last part. No? So I, I just wanted to 
um, show you how I, I use this in my own research, now, some of the methods that I showed you previously. So in 2007, I successfully defended my uh, doctoral dissertation on Leander Luxine at the University of Tokyo. So in particular, I singled out bipolarity as one of the main characteristics of his architecture. So bipolarity, no, it's, it's a concept that is often applied in physics. It means um, that something has two natures. No? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and dynamic tension is actually a result. Um, it was I. It was um, a series of of buildings. No, I got at the offices of Leandro V. Luxin. So um, I think I seven seventy five or eighty uh, buildings. No, and most of them I, I concentrated on the ones that I would be able to visit. No, the ones that were still standing. Though those were the things that I was interested in. And for each project, I took lots of notes. I visited the site. I took photographs. I made notes. I made sketches. And I, I arranged them into um, yeah, this kind of format. No, it was easy for me to organize the information if I had them per building. No? And of course, I correlated a lot of this to um, Luxin, his life. No? He was born in Negros and uh, to uh, to a wealthy family and how he was exposed to these kinds of houses you know, that we see in the photograph. And how in 1947, he studied uh, music at the conservatory uh, at the USD. You know? When he entered the USD, he wasn't uh, an architecture major. He was interested in architecture, but he was kind of iffy because yeah, architecture has a lot of math and he was kind of scared of the cut. So he entered the conservatory of music, but after a while, he realized that, um, yeah, he's not going to be as good as the celebrated pianist, soloists, no? And he said, yeah, uh, I'm going to shift to architecture because he's even quoted as saying that when he entered USD architecture, he realized that everyone else was as bad as, at math as he was. So it wasn't an issue. So I also looked at the connections between modern art and his architecture, because he was very involved with Fernando Zobel. Fernando Zobel was really one of his mentors. So I, I was trying to see connections between uh, Zobel's art and Luxin's architecture. And after this, so I went back um, after, after doing the visual survey and uh, after doing the archival research on Luxin. So I went back to my buildings and I started analyzing them. So I did a sort of figure ground comparison. No, I, I, in this case, I was looking at volumes. No, look, since architecture has always been described as floating, no? and that was my first clue. So I said, okay, if they're floating, what exactly floats? How does it float? No, so I, I started no, looking fig using figure ground and separating the floating element. No from the ground plane. So I was able to determine like three parts of why Luxin's uh, buildings are actually floating because there's the, the, the floating volume, no? floating volume that floats. And there is of course the ground plane and there is of course the area of displacement, but within that area of displacement in between the floating volume and the ground plane is of course your supports. No? The, the things that support the floating volume. So I was able to say, yes, our, uh, Luxin's architecture does indeed have a floating quality. And um, I was able to look at the different ways in, in which these were interpreted in his architecture. So for example, I was looking at the forces. This is the vertical buoyant force. There are also slanted uh, angled buoyant forces. And of course, um, the last one, and I, I completely forgot to put that slide. It's of the CCP, which is the curved um, buoyant forces. No, so I, I look at the progression from vertical to slanted to curved. And then I said there were other buildings of Luxin that seem to be floating, but they're not. And why are they not floating? So I looked at the Church of Saint Andrew, um, and I was saying that 
actually the the floating volume no it's more sculptural and it's still connected to the ground no whereas in the floating floating quality there's complete separation from the ground plane but for the for for this kind of example no the church of saint andrew and um you can see that the volume is still connected to the ground so it's kind of like flying away but it's being held back no there's that kind of tension so i call this actually so I, I also saw this in the Philippine Pavilion at the World Expo in Osaka. So I started calling this one grounded flight, you know, because it's trying to fly away, but it's being held back. And I looked at these kinds of structures. So these were the structures that I classified under grounded flight. You know, and I said that, yeah, they're more pointed in nature. They're more connected to the ground plane and they have different kinds of supports, mostly angled supports. Okay, so next I also looked, because I've been looking at only his forms, no? I, I said, okay, let's go inside. What are the different ways that Luxin divides his space, you know? And I was looking at um, this particular quality, you know? uh, and I call it enclosed openness. So again, you see the duality of being enclosed but being open. So for example, I was looking at the church of the holy sacrifice you know how the 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 core you no know, the altar is at the center but and you think it's accessible re readily accessible at all sides but when you enter the chapel you realize that it's visually accessible but physically the 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 barriers throughout the church kind of stagger your approach towards the altar so it's not a complete you know, straight approach towards the altar. You are visually connected, but physically, you know, you are hindered by several things, you know, the planter box, the pews, even the arrangement of the pews and, and the entrances. These are staggered differently. And that was interesting. That was very interesting because it's, it's very much like how in Asian spaces, we don't use walls much, but you can understand the division of space no? even without um, physical barriers, but more of implied barriers. And, and these implied barriers make us realize how the space is organized. And then I went back to my original visual survey and I started you know, um, color coding them according to the things that I observed. And in, in some cases, a project could exhibit both or just one or the other. You know? And I, I classified the objects, uh, sorry, the buildings um, into different categories. For example, I, I, I put all my notes, I organized all my notes. Um, this is an example of the um, public buildings, the government buildings of Luxin. And this is another example. Um, the, the purple ones are his churches and the pink ones are his hotels. So... I classified them by use and I was trying to see if there were any congruencies or similarities no, um, within those categories. So, And from there, I was able to derive uh, four characteristics of Luxin's work that embodied bipolarity. So these are the floating quality, rounded flight, enclosed openness, and the alternation of opposite spatial character. So floating quality and grounded flight are, of course, observations on the exterior form, whereas enclosed openness and alternation of opposite, opposite spatial character are more of um, interior observations. So I then tried to answer whether or not Luxin's architecture was truly Filipino. So I tried to correlate my building data to historical, archival, and sociocultural research. You know? So I, I tried to look at how Luxin fit in to this whole narrative of Filipino architecture. And from there, I was able to produce a holistic understanding of Luxin's work. So bipolarity and its manifestation can be largely related to developments after the war, in which the Philippines was finally, finally granted independence. And the post-war period was characterized by a lot of introspection. A lot of people were asking, who are we? We were under the Spanish for 300 years. We were under the Americans. Um, and then we were, yeah, under the Japanese for a while. Are we Asian? 
but the way we were the way we were um we've been colonized for so long no so are we european what are we so a lot of artists were thinking about this trying to answer the question who is the filipino no and this was apparent in literature this was apparent in visual art in painting in sculpture and of course luxin with his connection to zobel no kind of imbibed this consciousness no of 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 how art should art and architecture should be you know should express the sentiment of the time and this search of for identity in filipino um in filipino architecture was apparent in his work in his forms and spaces so you can actually see the post war period as very significant for the development of a lot of the architects so there weren't any more the the pensionados who were trained abroad but Luxin was trained solely in the Philippines of course he traveled abroad and was influenced by such but his formation his foundation as an architect was here in the Philippines so now to summarize that um modern architecture in the Philippines is sorely underappreciated it's very important period um but people don't know that because it's it's something they grew up with it's something that they think that only old architecture or spanish colonial or american colonial need be important but that's that isn't the case so it's hoped that through this workshop we may be able to help people understand that modern architecture is part of this larger international narrative that we are actually a very active part of So the data produced in this workshop is the first step in refining the character of modern architecture. So through this presentation I hope that you understand that in order to define architectural character we need to analyze architecture, the physical structure to extract the elements. Architecture is a combination of many factors through forms, no? All of these factors are expressed in forms. So when we analyze architecture, the first thing we should look at really are forms. But again, this needs to be correlated to um to social historical data. It needs to be looked at holistically, no? So it's hoped that further research you no know, will result from this that will inform cultural heritage enthusiasts and practitioners so that these buildings may be further conserved and appreciated by generations to come so thank you maraming salamat do maregado gozaimashita